you were growing up in France in the late 18th century, there's a good chance you, or someone you knew, would end up serving in the army. on! Under Napoleon's leadership, the whole of French society was galvanised by a constant need for victory on the battlefield. It was either that, or the country might fall. France was surrounded by powerful enemies who wanted to destroy the Republic, and they decided the best form of defence was attack. En avant, march! Out of France's struggle for survival was born one of the greatest fighting forces ever assembled. Napoleon's Grande Armée was established in 1804 from a force originally gathered for an invasion of Britain. In the end, it never crossed the English Channel and instead went on to inflict crushing defeats on the major powers of Europe in battles like Austerlitz and Borodino. But look at paintings from the period history books written in the intervening centuries, and very recent Hollywood movies, and you'd believe its success was all down to Napoleon and his tactical genius. What about the men who did the actual fighting? What challenges did they face? Although few common soldiers left detailed accounts, we can piece together evidence from a range of contemporary sources to reconstruct their daily experience. In this episode, we're going to step into the boots of those ordinary men who lived and died serving Napoleon's grand ambitions. If you get a bullet in the leg, an arm, you're going to fall down. Those injuries, they often end up as mortalities. I've been drafted into the Van Turnium de Lene, a living history group representing a real unit in Napoleon's army, using meticulous research to sort facts from fiction, and bring the early 19th century to life. I'll be finding out how dangerous life really was for these men, and how likely it was that you'd make it out alive. The French army needed lots of soldiers at the turn of the 19th century. The revolution of 1789, which culminated in the bloody end of the French king Louis XVI, did not go down well with the royal families of Europe, and the French soon found themselves at war with Britain, Austria, Prussia and Russia. When the ambitious Napoleon Bonaparte became supreme leader of France, the number of enemies only grew. The Corsican upstart was threatening to conquer the whole of Europe, forging an empire which encompassed much of modern Spain, Italy, Germany and Poland. But despite the constant need for fresh troops over these years, they didn't let just anyone in. Soldiers had to meet a standard set of requirements. Let's see if I'm up to scratch. Hello guys. I've turned up for my first day in the French infantry. Um, I assume I have to pass some tests to actually get in right. What kind of entry requirements are there? So in terms of entry requirements, you have to be a man mostly between 20 and 25 years old. If you're a conscript, if you're a volunteer, you could actually conscript from the age of 16 after wow. 1806 or so, but you had to have permission of a parent or a tutor. Um, your height, would not be a barrier to your entry, It'd just decide where you would go. So your height, you're quite tall, you probably actually end up in the Grenadiers. Um, the average height of the day was about five foot six, five foot seven. So if you were around that height, you would be in the Fusiliers, which what we are. And then if you were any shorter than that, you're probably in the Voltigeurs, which are the skirmishers of the French infantry. Uh, in terms of any medical uh, issues, you would have to have a sort of quick inspection by the surgeon of the regiment. And so long as you've got all your fingers, because you need all your uh, fingers got them. in order to, especially these two, these two are the most important these, because okay. one is yeah. a trigger finger and you need, need them to bite to cartridges. And that leads us to another requirement. You'd have, yeah, especially this side of your uh, face, you need these teeth. So okay. if you, because bite yeah, the biting paper, the cartridges, okay. yeah. yeah. So if you were a cons uh, of conscription age and you didn't want to be conscripted into the army, you did have a lot of cases where they would physically maim themselves to avoid the draft. Uh, another uh, thing, 
you're not married, are you? I'm afraid so. Oh, yeah. Well, you can't be in the army. You can't be. <laughs> okay. You, you can't. You can't be in. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can't be in the army if you're if you're married at this time. That's um, interesting. Why? There is a psychology of you've got something to desert to. Because yeah. desertion in the French army is always a problem, right from the start of the Revolution Wars, right through to the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Perhaps one reason so many soldiers ran for it was because they'd been forcibly dragged into the army as conscripts. At least once a year, French men between 20 and 25 drew lots to see if they'd be packed off to war. Detailed physical descriptions of new recruits were taken to aid the gendarmerie in hunting down runaways. Soldiers who deserted might face a punishment known as the bullet, where they were chained to a cannonball and were required to carry out hard labour. In the most serious cases, you might be condemned to death by firing squad, or, as it was sometimes known, having your hair washed with lead. We talked a little bit about conscription. If I'm conscripted into the army as opposed to, to coming in as a volunteer, are you treated slightly differently? The only, the only way you're treated slightly differently is that if you're a volunteer, you do get an extra francs worth of pay each month. Uh, and that lasts until uh, the first four years of your service. Are you, you're able to choose the, the, the regiment you join as, as well, aren't you, as a, as a volunteer? As a, I think if you're conscripted, you just get sent wherever you're yes. sent. Yes, yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. So volunteering, you'll be you're joining whichever arm you're volunteering for, whereas conscription, you're, uh, unless you can ride a horse, you will probably be conscripted into the infantry. Uh, and that will be, depending on where you live, you'll be conscripted into a surgeon regiment and be sent to their depot. Now, for example, our guys recruited from modern day Belgium and uh, the Netherlands, they would be sent to the regiment's depot, which was in Julich, as it's called today. Back then it was called Juliers. It's a German town today. Okay. That was the depot of the regiment until 1814 when it got taken over by the Allies. Got it. So you get there and presumably that's the point at which you get given your uniform. The idea that French soldiers were always as well turned out as contemporary artworks suggest is a bit of a myth. As well as shortages during wartime, there was plenty of corruption among military suppliers and contractors. One French regiment recorded receiving a shipment of boots with cardboard soles. And even when smart parade dress was available, it might not have suited everyone. Pour cet uniforme, un homme doit être bien bâti, bien fait. A man of 20 is not yet formed. Nay, we were joined by conscripts who were under 19. These accoutrements gave them an absolutely silly look. The stereotype of the French Napoleonic soldier is the blue uniform, the shako which you're wearing with the, with the bright, shiny brass plate didn't necessarily reflect reality for the vast majority of the time. These are expensive, these cost a lot of money to make. Um, soldiers, if you're wearing it every day, day in, day out, they're expensive to replace. With that in mind, your great coat would be what you would wear the vast majority of the time. You'd wear these on parade, you'd wear these on special occasions, uh, and generally on battles, yes, you would wear these, um, but not necessarily all the time. In clement weather, rain, um, cold, actually sometimes if it's incredibly hot, the great coat can actually help keep the, the, uh, the heat off you because you actually wear another smaller jacket underneath the heavy long. Maintenance of whatever uniform they received was also a constant headache for soldiers. There was a lot to keep clean. There is 33 individual brass buttons on this, every single one of which needs to be polished. On this, there is another 12 individual, very nice, bright, shiny brass buttons, again, all of which need to be polished. The shako that you're wearing under that nice cover, there's a nice, briny brass shako plate, uh, again, all of which needs to be polished to a wonderful, nice shine. The belts um, as well need yeah, to be polished. Yeah, belts need to be whitened. And underneath the cover here, you've got your black uh, lid for your uh, jaburn, your cartridge box. Yeah. That needs to be you know, polished as well, your shoes polished. So, it, uh, and the soldiers would do it. One thing I find fascinating about these uniforms, these soldiers weren't, not much consideration was given to sort of gymnastic exercise, was it? These, these uniforms were designed to be restrictive because soldiers were meant to stand still. That was the kind of ideal at the time. 
when we're talking about the style of warfare, it was very much line, uh, line formations. In terms of any exercise, um, there was dancing and sabre practice. That was the exercise that you generally did. In the French army, you're marching a lot. Yes. Uh, so... What was it, 30 kilometres a day they were expected quite, to march? On, on average, yeah, during the, yeah, the, the quickest campaigns. Like the Auslitz campaign, I think, Davout's corps marched something like that, 30 kilometres a day. Half of his corps didn't make it to the battle because they were exhausted. No, you but imagine, some yeah. of them did and uh, helped turn the tide of the Battle of Auslitz. The combined weight of kit and weapons carried by regular fusiliers was around 25 kilograms, and even more for grenadiers. It was also expected that soldiers would wear their haversacks into battle. Little wonder then that any items considered unnecessary to survival were often left on the side of the road. A French soldier had to carry pretty much his entire life uh, in his pack, and one of the packs looked like these. This one weighs about 11 kilos, he's got his great coat on the back there, and in that would be all of these items. So you'd have your parade dress, spare pair of breeches, a nice pair of gaiters there, you'd have a spare pair of boots, hobnail boots, plus all of the equipment that you needed to clean them, because soldiers need to polish their boots. A couple of linen shirts, these ones quite rough, pretty uncomfortable. A summer linen waistcoat, a bit more comfortable, keeps you cool. That can go under your jacket. And then a lot of equipment here, which was for basically keeping yourself and your gear clean. So things like this, this is not a whip for torturing people. This is for beating your clothes to get the dust and the clay pipe powder because the same clay that was used to make these pipes was used to clean the jackets, so this was used to beat it out. You'd have other things, so soldiers would carry all of their money with them, but once they were paid, they had to pay for their own repairs, so all of this kit was technically owned by the emperor, not by the soldier themselves. If they did have any spare money left over, well, it might go on these. Now, you might see with this pack of cards, it's got a king on the front. From 1792, packs of cards like these were actually banned because the French Revolution obviously got rid of the monarchy. But by the Napoleonic period, they were back in fashion. Napoleon himself was obviously an emperor. Many of his marshals were kings across Europe. So that was fine again. And then otherwise, you've got things for personal care. So you've got a little mirror, a little comb for getting rid of bugs. Soldiers were pretty much eternally affected by lice. They might have carried a toothbrush. We know Napoleon brushed his teeth. Not sure if French soldiers did. They might have used a twig or something like that. A little knife, many uses. And everything else here is for cleaning weapons and equipment. So a little bit of steel wool here for cleaning and polishing weapons. All of this stuff here because soldiers had a lot of time to kill and they needed to keep everything clean. With their uniforms issued and bags packed, infantry recruits were subjected to at least three months of intensive drill training. They were taught the basics of marching in step, how to move as part of a larger unit, and crucially, how to load and fire their musket. Les officiers nous permettaient pratiquement aucun répit. Nous avons dû répéter 100 fois les positions Garde à vous et repos. We had to learn the march step. Two feet in length from one heel to the other, 76 paces per minute. That's what the sergeant kept yelling at us. Hey guys, I'm gonna be late for training, but just a quick request to subscribe to the channel, leave us a comment, hit that notification bell. I'll see you in a bit. All right, Matt, we're here for some musket training. The weather's not doing what we want it to, but no. You're protecting your musket right now according to the French drill regulations, right? Yeah, so this uh, is a manoeuvre which is called uh, arme sous le bras gauche. So this would be done when it starts to rain. So the objective is to keep the lock protected, which is protected underneath my uh, left armpit. And also to make sure that uh, no water gets down the barrel. Inclement weather uh, can cause a tremendous amount of misfires. Yeah. 
a lot less reliable. A lot less uh, reliable, and the more muskets that are less effective, the less effective the volleys of the uh, battalion. So I guess commanders probably wouldn't be keen to fight in this kind of weather. No, uh, but, if uh, they but they uh, if they had to, then they would have their soldiers holding their muskets like this as much as possible. Okay, well let's go through the the loading process. Um, is it fair to say that the the, the French musketry didn't have a great reputation but the French musket did they thought they thought it was the best in Europe at the time so the French musket uh, the French infantry musket as we typically call it uh, colloquially it's called a Charleville but this is a bit of a sort of Americanism because uh, they got shipped so much of them in the American War of Independence this musket is uh, there's a reason it was copied by so many because I mean for a start the bands which hold the barrel to the stock uh, very easy to take off, so it's very easy to take off for cleaning and maintenance. Um, it's also a very yeah, sleek uh, design. The brown vest was more about quantity rather than quality. Well-drilled British soldiers using the brown vest were capable of firing three rounds a minute, but the French weren't far behind. So to start the loading process, I'm going to be at shoulder arms or porte arm in the French uh, army. The first order is uh, charge du somme, charge arm. So I bring the musket here. The lock is just below my uh, breast level, my nipple level, and my thumb is ready to open the prison. The order comes, ouvrez le bassinet. I bring my hand behind the stock down to my cartridge box and open up my cartridge box and grab hold of a cartridge. Then the order comes, Deshere cartouche. <laughs> That's when you bite and spit off the paper. And more so, this is the only time you look down and pour just enough powder into the pan. Fermé la bassinet. And then you bring your arm down here. Lame à gauche. Cartouche dans le canon. And pouring the powder all the way in. The ball in real life would have gone down at this point as well. Yep. Tire la baguette. Now the baguette is That's literally the rod, the yes baguette <laughs> yeah because uh, the word baguette is French for stick. Bore. All you need is about two taps. You don't need any of this. Yeah. Just two quick taps so you can hear it go home. Remette la baguette. Then the final order. Fur. Having seen the expert do it, now it was my turn to take a shot. At least I didn't have to aim at anything. Arm. So bring this arm and there. Tw twist the gun towards you, and then bring it around. Bring them there. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yep. Yeah. Then cock it. I wasn't supposed to look. Was I? Not really. Okay. Jus. That's right. Fur. Quite a, quite a blast in your face, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I once read, Matt, that for every 500 balls, roughly, that were fired in a Napoleonic battle, perhaps only one would be a fatal shot. Is that, is that true? Uh, it's probably not far off the mark in terms of killed. Uh, but the, you're, if you get a bullet in the leg, an arm, you know, some part of the body, you're going to fall down. You're going to be what we call order combat. You're going to be out of action, essentially. And, you know, the fatalities compared to the injuries that you see in the Napoleonic period, there's far more battlefield injuries than mortalities. But, of course, when you get those um, injuries, they often end up as mortalities through... Uh, infection, uh, disease, you know, uh, wounds getting infected um, and people not surviving amputation, which was the common, most common sort of, um, if they couldn't get the ball out uh, safely and extract it, then you were going to lose a limb, which was very common. Although a single musket ball could undoubtedly be lethal, commanders knew their best chance of victory was to confront the enemy with as much firepower as possible. Under Napoleon, this led to some quirky innovations in the drill manual, as different methods of formation firing were tested in battle. 
Okay, so James, fine body of infantry you've got here. Okay. Um, you're about to go through, a, 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 I guess it's a fairly unique um, tactic that the French would use, firing in two ranks, the third rank passing the musket forward. Yeah. Why did they use this tactic particularly? They use this tactic to um, put shock into the enemy. So basically um, what would happen is the first two ranks would be firing while the third rank was loading and passing a loaded musket to the man in the second rank. So you've got like a little, um, I could say like a fire, like a machine gun going right, down the okay. ranks. So if you think about a hundred or so men in that front front and second line, you'd, you'd be like... Doof, 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 doof. So it's essentially not letting up, it, it, there's it's cavalry not coming up. in, there's no gaps in your fire for, for them yeah. to sort of exploit, that kind of thing. Um, we believe that um, Marshal Desai used it at Marengo when he, atta when he came, turned up to the battle late, the battle was already lost, um, Napoleon had lost the battle, Marshal Desai turned up and um, they used for the Duronc, which um, absolutely broke the Austrian lines right, and okay. won the battle. Okay, so quite effective then. Very so, effective. Not as fun for the guys in the third rank who are just loading and passing <laughs> forward, but never mind. Right, we're going to let you guys uh, show us exactly how this is done, so take it away. Good to do wrong! Peloton! Um. Commence le fort! Firing in two ranks allowed all the muskets in a platoon to be used without the front rank having to kneel down, which was thought to slow down forward momentum. The French had experimented with all three ranks firing at once, but there was a real risk the men at the front would be shot in the back of the head, which was far from ideal. That was great, James. So our enemy infantry are scared witless now from uh, the, the feu de du ronc. What happens now if they decide to get a little bit cocky, they're coming in for a charge? How, how do you react to that? So basically what you do is um, when you got to um, very close quarters to the infantry, um, you'd, you'd give the order to quasi le bay en net, which is basically one, two manoeuvres at eye level. And as you got close to the enemy, you are in the drill book of the French, um, 1791, you can fire from the hip. Okay. The musket is always loaded. It's, it's, there's no if so, it, the musket has always been loaded, so you can fire straight into your enemy. Usually the enemy would have ran by then. Yeah. One of them would have broke. There, there was very, very little hand-to-hand um, -hand combat in the Napoleonic Wars, because who'd want to get stuck with that? Suicidal, <laughs> right? And I can imagine you're not going for accuracy there. It's the sort of the last moment possible to, to yeah. take that shot, just to essentially break that charge up. Firing from the hip was also a dangerous business. If troops were packed closely together, there was a real risk your musket could ignite your neighbor's cartridge box. Again, not ideal. Now I'm able to um, let the front rank um, show you what how you would fire from the hip, if that suits. Let's do it, James. Let's okay. see. Let's see what's happen if you've got some uh, Austrian infantry coming coming straight at you. Quasi le nipped. Come into the fur. Once training was complete, French troops would soon get used to the hardships of army life. Young conscripts were almost inevitably subjected to a gauntlet of initiation ceremonies, hazings and general mockery by older soldiers. Newcomers were also expected to grease the pot, which meant buying their comrades meals and drinks. Je suis fatigué surtout de voir les pauvres conscrits tourmentés, volés et humiliés. You cannot imagine how bleak was the fate of those unfortunate children at that time. If I recounted everything they had to bear in the way of thefts and sufferings, people would believe it an exaggeration. We also gained some insight into the experience of French troops from the colloquial language they used. As we find with many periods of history, the Napoleonic Wars give us some great and memorable slang phrases. And I've got a few in here. So the first few describe older experienced soldiers or veterans. So one I've got here is dura queer, which means hard to cook. Something like, 
tough as old boots, tough guys basically. Also a VL moustache, an old moustache because only certain ranks and men of experience were allowed to wear one. They also apparently referred to the Imperial Guardsmen, the elite troops, as late immortel, harking back to the classical world once again and the bodyguard of the Persian kings. The regimental eagle, obviously one per regiment, that was the thing that everyone had to rally around, was affectionately called Luazo, the bird, or Lukuku. There were some great nicknames for enemy infantry, and I'm pretty sure you can work out which nations are being referred to here. So you've got Le Godin or Le Kaiserlix, that's the British and the Austrians. And some of the terms give us an insight into more mundane aspects of soldierly life. So things like the word they used for beef meant something like hardwood. The term for fleas was la mie de pan, or breadcrumbs, and that just gives us an idea of how common it was for soldiers wearing coats like these to be covered in fleas and lice, basically. There were also numerous ways that they described being hungry, and in fact, despite Napoleon spending a lot more money on keeping his troops nourished than his predecessors, starvation was still a massive problem in his army, particularly on campaign. There were also some inventive names for other groups within the French army, so the well-heeled cavalrymen, the cuirassiers, were called gilets de verre, so steel vests. I'm sure they were called ruder things as well. French artillery was affectionately called le flute à gros bec, the big mouth flute. Although regular infantry weren't trained to use cannons, they were well aware of the damage they could do. Napoleon himself was a master of artillery, having learned his trade at the École Militaire in Paris. He was also pretty ruthless. At the Battle of Austerlitz, he ordered his cannons to smash a frozen lake as it was being crossed by the retreating Russian army, condemning those on the ice to a watery grave. There is, however, absolutely no evidence that he turned his guns on the pyramids. Can we talk a little bit about the loading process? How do you go about loading a cannon like this? This one's a little bit smaller than perhaps they, yes. there would have been on the battlefield. This one's actually a two-pounder. Um, the French, uh, at the beginning of the war, uh, their smallest was a four-pounder. Um, the French tended to have more sixes and nines, um, and uh, later on they went on to the, the uh, 12s and 24s. Uh, the British tended to have slightly smaller. Obviously, they've, they've got to travel with them even further. A well-trained French artillery crew would be able to fire around two or three rounds per minute, lobbing iron into enemy ranks at anything up to 1.5 kilometres. So first off, what he's doing, he's taking any remnants of an old cartridge that may still be in there. And as you can see, that's like a giant corkscrew. Then to make sure there's no burning embers, because the last thing you want to do is put another charge inside when you've got a, a burning ember in. Okay, so that's made that all clear. So that's quite similar to what you might do with a, a smoothbore musket at this point, right? You have to clear, you have to clear out the barrel to make sure it's not, there's no fouling inside. That's correct, it is exactly the same, uh, just on a bigger scale really. Next, the cartridge is going in. Uh, we're actually using a paper cartridge, but uh, quite often it was uh, made off uh, cloth. Ready? Uh-huh. All he's doing there is he's making sure that the actual charge is into the rear, to the breech of the gun. And now, in order to actually uh, ensure that the flame can actually get to it, I have to pierce that bag. It's right here. And there was different ways of priming. You had uh, tubes, you had loose powder. I'm using loose powder. So that's so the spark goes from, make, sh make sure it has that connection of gunpowder from the top through into the That's great. So charge. once you light the top, that, that flame literally goes into the cartridge. You would have shot in front of the cartridge. Uh, once the, the charge um, is ignited, there's a large expanse uh, and volume of gases. They push the ball straight out of the barrel. With a cannon ready to fire, it was time for me to get out of the way.
So we've just seen that even a very small cannon like this one can make a very big boom, basically. What types of cannon do the different nations sort of use during the Napoleonic Wars? Are they all very similar? Uh, that's correct. They are very similar. Um, it's mainly the calibre, the, the actual sizes that, that seem to change. Um, Wellington, his army, uh, the, the Royal Artillery, they go for accuracy. So they can hit a particular target at any particular time. However, they were then uh, targeting all different guns to different locations. Uh, Wellington, um, he really didn't like his gunners. Right. Uh, whereas uh, Napoleon, obviously, uh, he served in the artillery uh, of France uh, with the academy, and he understood all of his, his daughters, as he called them. Uh, so one of the tactics he would have is he would want to break up the infantry, so he would have all of the guns aim at a particular area and blast away through. The cavalry could then go through and um, do their job. And what kinds of uh, different shots would you get uh, as, a, as, a, as a gunner? I know obviously that we, we're not firing any, any cannonballs today, but they had lots of different kinds of shot that they would use for all kinds of horrible purposes, wouldn't they? That's correct. Um, on land, uh, the guns, uh, they could fire just a solid ball, which is commonly known as a round shot. Uh, you could have exploding shell, which most people know as a shrapnel today. You've got grape, you've got all sorts. I see. I, I, we often see in films, don't we, when a, a cannon is fired at a, a body of men, it essentially explodes on the ground when it hits there. Is that true, or was it, was it more kind of rolling through and sort of taking <laughs> people's legs out? Uh, the main uh, ambition is to, to get the ball just to bounce just in front of the infantry, and then bounce up into the the men. The, the shells can explode, and you can have um, a ball which is hollow, it's got a, a fuse, as it's lit, you'll fire it above the heads of the infantry, and the fuse gets ignited as it's coming out. Once it's above the infantry, it then explodes. It wasn't only different ammunition, but types of trajectory that could swing a battle. During his first command at the Siege of Toulon, Napoleon found a way to subdue the defenders despite the small number of artillery pieces at his disposal. And, and cannon, they don't only fire straight at the enemy, they can fire up as well. Mortars start to come in during this period. That's correct. If, if you want to get um, like over the walls of uh, a castle or uh, other fortifications, then a mortar's perfect. Uh, is it true that he would often send his uh, cavalry in, make the enemy form square, and then it would pre present a nice big target for his it artillery? It does. Artillery love uh, infantry when they're formed square because they're large um, target and very easy picking. While there wasn't much an infantryman could do about a high-speed cannonball, they did at least have some effective tactics for dealing with their other nemesis on the battlefield, cavalry. Not that it would have made a charge of heavily armed horsemen any less terrifying. On the defensive, Napoleon effectively deployed giant divisional squares against the mounted Mamluks in Egypt, while in attack, he became adept at making cavalry and artillery work together. From light lancers and uhlans to armoured cuirassiers, the French cavalry was the envy of Europe. Here comes the cavalry. Right, John, we just saw you in action there. That was fantastic. What, what I always think about the Napoleonic Wars, it, artillery, infantry tactics have come on so much, but cavalry is ultimately being used the same way as it, it's been used for centuries, right? So yes, they use the cavalry in the same way. So they would exploit gaps, uh, be able to move around the battlefield quickly, uh, a lot of reconnaissance. Um, and that type of thing, but they were still, when it came down to it, it was a hard charge with the sabres uh, into the enemy to give them a good fright. Because a, a horse like this, it's a pretty powerful, it's the tank of the day, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so he weighs about 800 kilos, so that coming at you at 40 miles an hour is gonna certainly knock, knock a few soldiers backwards. And so uh, cavalry, was it ultimately about getting 
in amongst formations once they're broken. It's quite hard to charge at a, a line of men who are standing with their bayonets pointed at you. Yeah, ideally they were primarily used to um, exploit gaps. So you're looking to be able to catch the infantry off guard, whether that's ambushing them from uh, cover um, or using that with combined arms so you can force infantry to do certain activities and form square so that then the cannons can uh, have a lot more effect as opposed to shooting the direct lines. Napoleon once wrote that cavalry is useful before, during and after the battle, which is hardly surprising. Audacious cavalry charges had all but won him two of his greatest victories at Eilau and Friedland. And you've got the, the sabre here. Is, yep. that, is that your main weapon that you're going to be using? Uh, so they use the sabre for when they're close and personal. Um, and then they also carried carbines as well um, for sort of light infantry tactics. So some of the dragoons and the French chasseurs could dismount and fight on foot. Uh, so that, that allows them a lot more versatility. They can get to other parts of the battlefield quicker and dismount and fight if necessary. And, and some French cavalry are still wearing plate armour essentially, aren't they? Or at least breastplates and, and helmets. This type, of, this type of cavalry, not so heavily armoured. Yes, so this is a, a light cavalry a uniform. It's the first chasseurs. Uh, heavy cavalry was still using armour and stuff like that, which is very, very effective in battle. Uh, when you are fighting on the battlefield, a lot of what hits you is something that's coming from behind. So the French heavy cavalry with their breastplates and back plates uh, was extremely effective. And often you see uh, infantry forming into squares as a kind of countermeasure against cavalry. You saw it happen quite effectively at Waterloo. Why does that work? Uh, so it provides a good uh, blocking tactic for the cavalry. Uh, cavalry uh, want to get in and around the sides. When infantry forms square, it allows them to face uh, the cavalry with their bayonets and prevents you from being able to remove around the flanks or rear. A staggering 150,000 horses were acquired for Napoleon's most ambitious campaign in 1812, when he ordered a vast multinational force to march into Russia. 600,000 men and 30,000 wagons made it the largest invasion force ever assembled at the time. But despite a major victory at the Battle of Borodino and the fact that his army succeeded in occupying Moscow, the great adventure soon turned into a living nightmare for the soldiers and animals of the Grande Armée. Now we know that hygiene in French camps was pretty bad. Latrines were little more than trenches dug a few metres from the tents. Washing your hands, it wasn't really recommended. There was no toilet paper, so people would use moss or leaves. Washing clothes, that wasn't something that happened regularly and neither was washing your body you'd also be sharing a bed with another soldier. So anything that he caught, you were getting as well. There's a common misconception that the freezing Russian winter killed off most of Napoleon's army on the retreat from Moscow, with temperatures so bone chilling that tin buttons supposedly turned to dust. But this can't be the full story. Well over half of the army had already been wiped out by the beginning of November 1812, before the winter cold truly set in. And it was primarily by a louse-borne disease called typhus, which spread easily in the cramped marching camps. Bourgogne s'endormit sur une natte de roseau et fut bientôt réveillé par l'activité des poux. Finding himself literally covered with them, he stripped off his shirt and trousers and threw them into the fire. They exploded like the fire of two ranks of infantry. He couldn't get rid of them for two months. All of his companions swarmed with lice. Many were bitten and developed spotted fever. Spots of gangrene appeared on men's fingers and genitals before signs of pneumonia and delirium set in. It must have been a horrifying way to go. Starvation and desertion also decimated the army as it limped its way back westwards, harassed by the enemy and denied food and forage by the Russian scorched earth tactics. It's estimated that fewer than one in six who set out on the campaign made it home.
Having been defeated and exiled by the Allied powers once, Napoleon threw the dice for the final time in 1815. Escaping his island prison on Elba and drawing together the battered remnants of the Grande Armée for one last stand. The experience of the few remaining veterans, who had now survived decades of bloody campaigns, must have been highly prized. Uh, James, hmm? um, I've been through training now, obviously. I've taken part in the battle and I've actually grown my own moustache. Hmm. So I was wondering if I was ready for promotion to the Imperial Guard. Ow. No, get on sentry duty. <laughs> The Battle of Waterloo was to be a step too far for Napoleon and his army. A combined force of British, German, Dutch and other Allied troops under the Duke of Wellington held the French at bay for long enough for Marshal Blücher's Prussians to deliver a decisive blow. Even the Imperial Guard, Napoleon's immortels, couldn't turn the tide this time. La mort s'est glissée sur nous de toutes parts. Des rentiers disparurent sous la mitraille. But nothing was able to stop our march. It continued with the same order as before, with the same precision. The dead were immediately replaced by those who followed. The ranks, although becoming fewer, remained in good order. Talking about casualty rates of the Napoleonic Wars is extremely difficult because the records simply aren't that detailed. However, it's estimated that around a million French soldiers died during the First Empire, that's 1805 to 1815. It's thought that about 15% would have been carried off by disease, that's three times more than died during combat. And you have to remember that mortality rates were high at the time anyway. Lots of those men would have died whether they joined the army or not. Ultimately, it depended on where you were sent. We know that a huge proportion of the Grand Armée was wiped out in a single campaign. If you were sent to Russia, there was a good chance you weren't coming back. For everyone else, you had a reasonable chance of surviving your term of service, even if you ended up fighting at the Battle of Waterloo. And it looks like I've got through my crash course unscathed. Thank you to the French 21st and 45th Regiments of the Line for making this video possible. Please don't forget to subscribe, like this video and leave us a comment. We've got another episode on the way very soon.
Hey guys, I've just launched a brand new YouTube channel called Survive History, where we're going to be experiencing some of the most dangerous, some of the most daring jobs from centuries ago. This is actually the very first video and the very first day of shooting. It's all about life in Napoleon's army. Please go and subscribe, leave us a comment and stay posted because there's lots more coming.